Hello and welcome to Refuse. As always, I'm Plume Noir and I have Butters being really cute by my side here. Uh, it's been just over two years and we are at the end. This is issue number 12 of Doomsday Clock. It's uh, 48 pages long and I believe I expressed a couple months ago that I was a little bit concerned how Jeff Johns was going to wrap this story up um, in just one issue, because it seemed like there was a lot going on and a lot to unpack. And I've actually taken a few attempts at this review, because uh, it, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack. This will be very, very spoilery. Um, if you don't want to know how it ends, I'm not going to review this like I would a, a normal issue, kind of check some things out, um, because there's more to it than that. Um, this issue um, wraps up the Doomsday Clock uh, series, which is kind of a, it's a sequel to Watchmen, now JR's here, um, a sequel to Watchmen, and uh, a finale, I guess you could say, uh, what the DC Rebirth was leading up to, and this was paved at the time to be the way of DC going forward. And I'm not quite sure... <sighs> I'm not quite sure how true that still is, uh, how much that goal has changed, because it's, because of all the delays with this book, it's almost like DC has moved on without it. And, um, God, John's really looking buff on this cover, isn't he? He's just really been working out there. Um, now, this book, you know, switched to a bi-monthly schedule, which... Happened to the original Watchmen series, but the difference is there. Um, the original Watchmen uh, series it reads best when you read it all at once, instead of you know a little dribble here every couple months. Um, but that also was its own universe. It didn't affect the greater you know <laughs> uh, a multiverse, a greater DC uh, universe. Um, with the continuing ongoing, so like the way this book was meant to do, and I imagine it still is going to do, because there's references, which is why I'm not going to review this the way um, I normally do, because I want to talk about this issue, what happens. If you're expecting a big fight, a big confrontation between uh, Dr. Manhattan and Superman, that doesn't happen. Um, I don't want to say they talk it out, but... Um, there is a conversation that changes everything, which really brings it back to um, what happened in Watchmen, uh, the original series. There's some great nods to that if you if you look for it. I'll be honest, I'm going to have to read this probably a couple more times. And I even said in previous videos that I'm going to have to read Doomsday Clock all at once um, because I think it's going to flow better a little bit that way. With the bi-monthly thing, it felt almost like padding, but I think it'll be better if it's done all at once. Um, having said that, I'm going to kind of jump into a few things. You know, even on the cover, you see Superman, an angry Superman, standing over John. You see John alone looking up at the the ticks of the clock here. Um, I got fingerprints on this. Um Kind of the duality. You know, he either sees himself destroying everything and being alone, or he sees himself succumbing to Superman. But what? What if there's a third option? Why can't John see past this moment? Um, and he does explain that. A lot of things are wrapped up in this book almost a little too quickly for my taste. Um, but what happens is, and let's try and bring this back to where we were. Um, Dr. Manhattan and Superman are on Earth. They're about to have their big confrontation. Um, meanwhile, John's Earth, what, back in the 90s, is about to end. Um, we find out what Ozymandias' plan is, um, which is pretty apparent. Um, it's pretty much almost the same plan he had. It's pretty much what he said in the beginning. Um, so we get a lot of the things here. I'm going to skip ahead because Superman ends up getting attacked by um, basically all of um, the rest of the world's heroes um, because he's pretty much an outlaw now for what happened in the, in uh, Russia. Um, 
for all the people being killed. Uh, he's also being attacked by uh, Black Adam and the villains he's been uh, collecting. So Superman is really outgunned. Uh, outgunned. And uh, during all this, he is confronted with Dr. Manhattan. And, you know, um, this is when uh, they have their talk here. Uh, he manages to, this is the one part here that I thought was weird. You know, he's asking Dr. Manhattan to help. And Dr. Manhattan is just watching. And uh, so for some reason in this panel, all the villains, all the people attacking Superman decide to take a moment so he can have a chat with Dr. Manhattan. Um, you know, how can you stand there and not do anything? My world once had a chance at peace, but after I left, it lost it. It fell into war. It's burning even now. And we're getting close to the moment where Dr. Manhattan can no longer see the future. Uh, and then he starts telling Superman, I am the one behind the changes in your life. The loss of your mentors uh, you've never known. Friends you've forgotten. Sorry, I'm <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble with YouTube for Dr. Manhattan Blue Wang here. Um, more specifically, I'm responsible for the deaths of your parents. I changed your life, Superman, out of cold curiosity. Will you destroy me for it? Or will I defend myself despite my sins? So Superman lunges forward. This is the scene we've been waiting for. Dr. Manhattan just closes his eyes. You get that great angry Superman, you know, red eyes. You, you know, just about to yell, burn, you expect. And he punches past him to attack... Um, What's the other Firestorm's name? I can never remember him. Uh, the, the bad Firestorm. Um, and Dr. Manhattan asks, Why would you defend me? And Superman says, I don't know what to think about all this. But I do know right now, right now you have a choice to make. You talk about me destroying you or you destroying me because all you see beyond this is nothing. But maybe there's a third choice. Which goes with um, Rorschach, too, who's abandoned the mask, you know, um, after he finds out, you know, he's found out that, you know, Rorschach got to his dad, and, um, but Batman and uh, Alfred convince him to put the mask on, to become Rorschach, but to make Rorschach his own. Uh, don't be the psycho that uh, Kovacs was, you know, be his own Rorschach. So in this, uh, they have their chat here. Um, who is she? You know, you're creating these photographs with every step you take. I assume they're important to you. Yeah, it's that famous picture. As you know, Lex has been collecting these pictures. You know, she was. Maybe the darkness you see. Maybe it takes everything you have to save your world. Now you see that's the key point. Uh, Rorschach Long puts on his mask. And when the villains are all coming back, and that's the thing, is we get to see some great people, like, you know, the Lady Flash is there, um, and Dr. Manhattan realizes, you know, I understand now. Everything ends. And then we see, basically, Superman being the last light in the world before it disintegrates. Oh, it's kind of stuck there. We get two pages, <laughs> a splash page of blackness, Nine panels of black. And then it reignites. And we see it's Superman's rocket coming to Earth. And here's where Jeff Johns channels Grant Morrison that I really like. Um, he gets meta on this. And remember, Dr. Manhattan keeps talking about the metaverse. And, well, it explains, uh, subtly explains it here. Um, the metaverse forms around its one and only sun. And we see the rocket landing in various places, various timelines. And we see uh, Superman being found by the Kents. Um, Dr. Manhattan, you know, had moved the Green Lantern out of Alan Scott's reach. So when the train crash happened, he was killed. But now he moves it back. So in 1940, I moved the Lantern back. So this reestablishes that Alan Scott will become the Green Lantern. And because, um, because Dr. Manhattan has made changes, um, Superboy, you know, because the, um, JSA had been around, uh, you know, his father tells him, 
you know, when I was a boy, my father told me stories of the Justice League of America, wartime heroes. So this inspires Clark to become Superman. So when the truck is about to hit the tree, Superboy is there to save him, to save his parents. And he realized, is that, is that our son? Because the Justice Society exists again, so does Superboy. And because Superboy exists, the Legion comes back. So it, it's it's kind of nice to see that linchpin. We're starting to see that post-crisis, which I pref I'll be honest, I prefer. I don't mind having the J JSA on Earth, too. But I do really like the JSA leading up to uh, the, the, the Justice League, all on one Earth. I, I like... I, I, I like the Justice League, and even when they're, um, you know, later on, there, you know, you got some of the older heroes with some of the young heroes teaching the next batch, uh, the next batch of heroes, you know, like what it was just before Flashpoint. I really like that. Um, so we get to see that uh, uh, Adrian starts figuring out what's going on, and. Um, he finally gets his uh, uh, Thunderbolt back, and yeah, the ring, Adrian realizes something's going on. The past and the future, my side backwards, are free. So while Superman is being attacked, you know, he's just getting whomped on. And then uh, he gets this, sorry we're late, son. Well, now this is the thing about comics. There are some things that just kind of gives you that, yeah! And this is one of those moments where you have the JSA and the Legion all coming to Superman's side. You know, and although, you know, some people like Stargirl has already been back, you know, we get the class, you know, look, we have Jade back. You know, we have Power Girl back. I know she ain't going to Earth 2, um, the new 52 version of Earth 2, and they, they kind of ruined her character anyway. We have... I love Power Girl, I admit it. You know, we have uh, the new Thunderbolt. Uh, it's just great to see. You know, you look around, it's just so awesome. It's just like, oh, oh yeah, this was worth it. And Dr. Manhattan starts explaining some of this stuff here. So, now that we have Superman, you know, back in 1938 making his first appearance, um, you know, Superman's timeline shifts. Oh, there is one thing I want to point out. Jeff Johns is still doing that Flash Rebirth thing from that limited series where Barry Allen created the Speed Force. And he is the center of it, and it goes forward and backwards uh, through time to affect other speed uh, speedsters. I hate that theory. I kind of like the whole thing that the Speed Force has always been around, and it's only been, you know, um, you know, uh, um, why am I blank? Max Mercury, who, you know, told Wally about it. Barry never knew about it until after he came back to life. Uh, but, yeah, decades later, a police scientist is struck by lightning and the birth of the Speed Force rattles the metaverse. Not a fan of that, I'll be honest. But I'm not going to dock it because that's Jeff John's personal thing. But here we get the interesting stuff. Earth 2 is born. So Earth 2, the JSA version with Batman and Robin and Superman, um, it's still around. It's its own Earth. Uh, after the first and greatest crisis, the Earth divides again. Now, after Convergence a couple years ago, crisis was undone and never happened. So I guess now it has happened again. So that's back on the table. And here we have Earth-1 becomes Earth-1985, a world unexplored even today. So we have the, um, the Earth-1 just before... Crisis on Infinite Earths. This is before the whole, you know, um, before everything changed. And uh, they now have their own Earth, where you do have classic Supergirl, headband Supergirl, and, you know, everything. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, more are created over the years, including one because of my interference. Very interesting. Very, very interesting on this. Um, is he referring to what they're going to call this Earth now? You know, that's post, um, post Doomsday Clock, uh, after the Flashpoint. Earth 52 is still out there. So you see the armored Superman, the silver tiara, um, Wonder Woman. 
is still out there. It's its own separate universe now. So people who came in, when did that start? Uh, 2011? Who came into DC Comics because of, you know, um, the new 52. If they like those characters better, they have their own universe now. Very interesting. Um, great splash page, uh, not splash page, not full panel, but a, a great panel here. Um, and here we have some of the future stuff here. So you see, you know, we have more of uh, the current heroes of, you know, Earth. You know, we have Jessica over here. Um, in the year 2020, Superman's timeline is bombarded by the reckless energies of the old gods. Once again, warp in the metaverse. It's July 2nd, 2025. A crisis unlike the metaverse has ever seen. One they will call Time Masters erupts. Interesting. And in its wake, Superman is revitalized. Um, and his greatest allies return. So he starts kind of doing predictions. Um, no matter how many times Superman's existence is attacked, he will survive. Because hope is the North Star of the Metaverse. It is January 2026. The timeline is restored. And Earth 5G is born. Now there has been talk... Um, Dan Didio has been talking about Earth's, uh, about the 5G timeline. Um, that that's going to be the, uh, what did he say, the ultimate timeline that covers everything. And so they are hinting up to this. Um, it's June 17th, 2026. Superman, <clears throat> excuse me, Superman goes on a quest to find Bruce Wayne's lost daughter so she can save Bruce's son. Interesting. Um. And here we start getting out, you know, uh, it, it, things like this won't happen because this basically is like a, a crossover with Marvel. In 2030, the secret crisis begins, throwing Superman into a brawl across the universe with Thor himself and a green behemoth stronger than even Doomsday who dies protecting Superman from these invaders. So yeah, sounds like Hulk <laughs> is going to save Superman and, and, and die, but he's immortal, so... But anyway, this probably won't come to pass. But here's where it starts getting interesting. Because, you know, uh, Superman appears in public for the first time in 2038. Uh, 22 years earlier, the cat's prayers for a child are answered when a rocket lands on their farm. Superman's timeline shifts forward again. 2038 now marks a different date. Uh, John, Martha, and their baby Colin. Um, the rocket arrives again in the year 2045, delivering the cats their only child. They find the rocket with their three-year-old daughter, Clara, in the year 2162. In 2965, Superman appears in Metropolis for the first time. Um, da -da -da. The, the rocket arrives, a child is loved, Superman is made. I now understand Superman's true purpose. He will show them the way. And in a millennium, when his timeline converges with the legions, humanity will finally embrace the ways of Superman. This is why I said he's channeling um, the, his inner Grant Morrison. This is the metaverse. Um, comics have like the sliding time scale. You know, they kind of have to update every few years. And as time goes on, Superman's origin will be updated. He won't have landed in 1939. He won't have landed in 1986 because it will be far enough in the future. Um, you know, in 2190, for example, he will have landed in Kansas, you know, what, 2160, you know, about 30 years before. Um, and that's what this is. Superman is the, the, the thing of hope that the metaverse, what is basically, you know, meta, you know, the whole DC Comics, hopefully they're still around, um, hinges upon. And so his arrival is what marks the sliding timeline, which we saw it was kind of going in that way because of all the changes Dr. Manhattan had made. Uh, but they spell it out here, which is really kind of neat. You know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I like it. So now the story ha has to wrap up. How do we wrap up this limited series? Because remember, we still have the mime and marionette out there. We still have the impending um, you know, nuclear crisis. We still have everything going on. Well, we get a short little panel here. Uh, between what I learned from Lex pon uh, pontificating, which took all the patience in the world, and this. Thank you, Bruce. Because Bruce went to uh, Ozymandias' owl ship, you know, which he took from Night Owl. Um, 
to get the information to clear Superman's name. Um, you know, uh, did what exactly? Everything we needed to clear Superman's name was on your ship. Yes, I know. I left it for you to find and give it to his wife, no doubt. It's all gone according to plan. You know, don't worry, Babastus. It's only John. Let him summon us. So now we're getting kind of the final showdown. Um, we have Dr. Manhattan. We have <laughs> poor comedian tied up, tied up. The mime, Marionette, Rorschach, and uh, Ozymandias. So basically, Ozymandias' big plan was to get John to save the world, his world. But the thing was, he needed to get John to care again. It's like what happened in Watchmen. You know, John got too detached, too scientific, and he needed Laurie up on Mars to give him that epiphany that life was unique. Although this plan, this all hinges on the fact that John had forgotten what he learned in Watchmen. And he became cold and detached again. You know, basically just kind of meddling with the DC Universe out of a cold scientific curiosity. Um, which, if I had a strike to get, count against it, that's the pivotal plot that it all hangs upon, is that he forgot what Laurie taught him. But Superman has given him hope again. He sees how important that is. Um, and how Superman will always be around. He will always be created by the metaverse to keep the metaverse going. And so now he's going to go back and fix things. Uh, but before he does, the comedian shoots uh, shoots uh, Ozymandias, which is kind of weird that, uh, that the comedian was even brought into this at all. It almost seems like his only point was to shoot him. So because of this, uh, Lex Luthor shoots the um, comedian with a... Uh, what do you call it, a vibrational frequency gun, uh, we see him grab it earlier. Um, which means it does. he doesn't even need John to send him back. Lex Luthor does it and sends him back to the moment where he dies, where he was grabbed from his fall. Well, he's sent back to that. Overall, it's a good ending for everyone in this book except Comedian. And since Ozymandias is dying, Rorschach saves him. Um, you live, pay for your crimes, rot in prison. You're not Rorschach. No, Rorschach is me, as bubble changes. You know, Long has made Rorschach his own. And uh, so now we still have the uh, marionette and my marionette, who is pregnant. Um, the whole thing was to get their son back. Um, you know, John says, I see the light now. I see my final purpose. And even goes back to Carver, the actor, the... The, the the actor who was being blackmailed um, for being homosexual. Well, John came back to him. Uh, I haven't been a very good friend, Carver, but I can see so many futures now. Make a good choice. Don't be afraid of what you feel. John even goes back and saves Carver. So instead of, you know, getting blackmailed, he comes out publicly, publicly as being gay. Goes quiet for a while and then comes back about 20 years later, um, gets a Best Actor Award, kind of Best Actor Award, kind of reboots his career, and, um, you know, basically, he, his slogan that John gave him, you know, don't be afraid of what you feel, uh, becomes a slogan of an act of, of the activist, and, um, uh, they do say something in here. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, here it is. And in 1973, he was instrumental in getting homosexuality removed from the American Psychiatric Association's, Association's Diagnosis Manual of Mental Disorders. So, yeah, he gets a happy ending. Um, and we see Clark's parents are alive again because he was able to stop the tree, uh, stop them from hitting the tree. The, the tree was fine, didn't need to be stopped. Um, there's, like I said, there's so much to unpack here. So, Dr. Manhattan goes back to his world, and, uh, basically he stops the nukes. He gets rid of all the, uh, nuclear weapons on the planet. But then, what happened to, uh, to the marionette and Mime's baby? Well, Dr. Manhattan took it. I now realize the blind spot to the details of this child's future is me. 
You know, I blame my blurred vision on my recent experiments involving the dialectic, u dialectical unity principle and give it more thought. So we'll come back to that. Uh, Dr. Manhattan dreams of his life that he could have had, although he is up on Mars. We get this juxtaposition here of uh, Clark being showed the constellations by his parents, and John is doing basically the same with this child. Look, John, a falling star. Shall we make a w wish? You know, I believe in wishes again. Destiny is not without a guiding hand. And John realizes he can't be the hero to his world the way Superman can. Because he didn't have the guidance of the Kents that the super that that, that Clark got that created you know the basically the the Superman. Um, I am a little excited by this. I do like where this goes, um, and with the last of his power, um, as a final thought, as I give the last of my power to this world and this child, so that this planet has a protector who will receive love and return it. So. Basically, he gives a, he gives away all his power and ceases to exist. Maybe a good ending for you know ha closest thing that to that to a happy ending that Doctor Manhattan can get. Um, but it leaves it open enough that he can be brought back. Remember, this is a guy who you know has reconstituted himself many times. So even he says he gives all his power back, you know, gives his power away, he could still come back. Um, so he saves the world, gives his life, but by giving his power to someone else and puts them in a lovely, loving home. So we see Dan and Lori in their disguise as they've retired and, uh, their daughter answers the door. Um, I'm sorry to bother you, but a friend of my mom and dad's brought me here. He said, they'll know what to do. And, uh, my name's Sally. What's yours? We get the final splash, a splash page here, and it's the marionette and the mime's child. John calls me Clark. Notice he's got Dr. Manhattan. He has Dr. Manhattan's powers. That's what he's done with it. Um, he has given this world Superman. This world now has hope again. Uh, so, yeah, it goes through a lot of this. There's uh, so much to unpack. I mean, there's even talks in here, which just makes it really interesting, coincidentally, that, you know, they... The book started with a lot of um, um, references on Doctor Manhattan's world. The, you know, they they even used the world the word deplorables like on the first page to kind of make uh, you know allegations to you know everything that's going on. Uh, they they even used the word impeachment on the day this came out. Trump was impeached. Um, completely coincidental. But what we see here is. A new DC universe. We have the JSA back. We have the Legion back. I know they just came back in their own series. Um, we have um, more hope for the future because we get to see that there is some plans here. That whole five G reference, but is DC really going to follow this? Or uh, because this is pretty big, having the J uh, JSA come back, um, we see the Earths have splintered off again. You know, the fifth, new 52 is its own Earth now. Um, I guess this is kind of, the Earth we have now is kind of a uh, Band-Aid version of the Earth 1 that became Earth 52. But it says here Earth 1 um, becomes Earth 1985. So um, this kind of undoes... You know, pretty much the whole 52 worlds theory, the multiver uh, multiversity thing, which, while I do like, I'm kind of okay with. There's a lot of retcons going in here, but they're not really exacting. Um, they give some ideas, and then you can go off from there. Um, I like the idea of Infinite Earths. You know, it's 52 is kind of limiting, while cool. It is still kind of limiting because when you do get another idea, it's hard to work it back in because then it's just, oh, it's, it's not another Earth. It's a parallel dimension. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I had to cover this a little bit differently, you know, because it's the finale of a, se of a series that's supposed to have long-lasting changes uh, to the DC universe that 
the DC Universe, like I said, has moved on without it, so I'm not sure how set in stone these plans are. I mean, obviously, I don't think they're going to cross over with the Avengers in the year 2030, but the next few years, as they're building up to the 5G timeline and the storyline coming up with the old gods, um, I think it's a roadmap, which is more than they had <laughs> at the beginning of the New 52. So I kind of have to review this on its own, but also as a conclusion to a series that's supposed to have such impacts, which Watchmen wasn't supposed to have. That was supposed to be a standalone story, a deconstruction, and it ended up being far more influential than uh, Gibbons and Moore intended it to be. Um, Speaking of Gibbons, one thing I want to say is the art in this book, I've been saying it throughout the whole series, wonderful. This uh, Gary Frank's art is just fantastic in this book. Oh, see that? Alan and Jade and Obsidian? How awesome is that? It, it just makes you feel good, doesn't it? So, yeah. Oh, in the back cover, we see the blood coming down. It was not actually blood at all. It was Superman's cape. So, what looked to be very ominous was actually not ominous at all. It was Superman's protecting everything, saving everything again. That's That was actually kind of a nice, clever visual. Um, I still think this book, this whole series, needs to be read from beginning to end. I, I think I'm going to do that with all 12 issues. I'm going to sit down at some point and read them all to see if it stands, the te I don't want to say a test of time, if it reads better that way. Whereas with the original Watchmen, yeah, you know, I could probably still have read that so many times over the past, what, uh, going on 30 years. Because um, I have one of the first, I think I have the first hardcover release of the collection and uh, that I bought many, many, many years ago. And I've read that so many times that I still sometimes notice new things that I didn't notice back then, you know, as I'm so familiar with the story. Um, I don't know if this series on a whole, if I start again and go, oh, wait, wait, look at that. Okay, I see the theme. I see what he's doing here. I see the symbolism that they set up. I don't know if it's going to do that. Time will tell. Um, but as far as, like, affecting the DC Universe, this is way more important than uh, Watchmen, which affected comics overall, all comics, you know, all the universes, the metaverse, if you will. See? Uh, so, yeah, I, you can hear the excitement. I enjoyed this issue. I didn't think he was going to be able to pull off what he did in 48 pages. Yeah, some of it seemed a little brief. Some of it was rushed. But it wasn't too bad. When you have a literal, you know, uh, deus ex machina, you know, I guess that's why they decided to, why Johns decided to have him basically kill himself and give his power away. Because... He's just too powerful on the table the way he is. You know, it's too tempting to have him always come in and save the world's problems. Although I kind of like the idea of him out there still exploring universes. Um, he could have been the new hyper time where any little thing happens. Ah, I was Dr. Manhattan fiddling with things. It's better than a Superboy prime punch. Let's be honest. Um, but like I said, I don't think he's gone for good because, you know, like Dr. Manhattan himself says, nothing ever ends. He contract he contradicts himself in this, but we know how comics are. Anyway, what would I grade this? You know, on on the whole, on just this issue, I'm going twelve o'clock. I'm going twelve I'm going scratch twelve o'clock. This book is good. I really enjoyed it. It gives some good fan service moments. Um, it gives, like I said, that two-page spread where you see the JSA next to the Legion fighting along to help Superman. That's that's why we read. <laughs> that's why we read this stuff, right? Um, and it's also nice that they kind of kept with um, the original Watchmen. It's not a big showdown between the two of them. They basically talk it out. And he has his epiphany. You know, sometimes it's not about just mashing fists against faces. You know, um, and I like that. It's a small detail. Maybe I'm alone in that. But um, I, I've been going on for almost 35 minutes here. I could go on longer. 
and this is me not even touching everything in this book. There's a lot going on, and I just wanted to get to the big important points and show you how the series ends. Um, so yeah, 12 o'clock, full 12 o'clock, love this book, and I definitely recommend this. Now, it's also helps, it also helps if you really know your DC history. Um, you may see some stuff that uh, if you're not really well-versed in uh, the DC universe, you may not understand the significance of it. Um, but if you've been following this series, and, you know, a few times it was kind of a little rocky there for a while, kind of felt like it was just muddling through, and then two months later it's like, oh, wait, what was... Oh, yeah, the last issue was the Mime's Origin. Um, this brings it totally worth it, um, makes the other issues worth it. So, yep, 12 o'clock, and I stand by that. So, as always, thanks for watching. My voice is starting to go, so I will catch you next time.